Good morning, church family. It is announcement time and we have a few things to share with you. Stu. First off, Lamb's Offering. Um, many of you have been in churches where the kids come down and grab some offering as they're coming down the children's story. Well, we're gonna be starting that next week. Pastor Sean is gonna be sharing more about it, but it's just an opportunity for our kids to get involved in supporting the community. So look forward to that, and Shauna is gonna be sharing more with us in the children's story today. Seniors, don't forget about the bus trip down to the Long Beach Aquarium. It's gonna be a great day down there. You'll leave, if you choose to go, at 8.30 on March the 10th. If you want to reserve your tickets, just call the church office. They'll give you all the details and let you know what to do. So again, that is March the 10th, 8.30 a.m., all the way down to the Long Beach Aquarium. Next week, we're starting a brand new sermon series entitled, The Final Week. This is gonna be a focus on the final week of Jesus' life, which was filled with deep teaching, harsh conflict, and acts intended to both comfort and confront. We really encourage you to come out for the very first of the sermon series entitled, The Final Week. That's next week, first and second service. We are excited to be hosting the Walla Walla Valley Academy Orchestra on March the 9th. They'll be performing at 4.30 here in the sanctuary. Come out and join us for that. And then tonight is the special APC Vespers that will be at 4.30. We hope to see you there. Well, that's our announcements for today. For more information, you can check our app, our bulletin. We still are having a little bit of challenge on the printing. We're getting that worked out. But you can find the bulletin on our brand new website or the app or of course, we always love to see you out at the Uconnect Center in the foyer. It's always special when you come worship with us and we hope that you have a really wonderful Sabbath day. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We can do better than that. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Amen. What a privilege it is to welcome you to the Loma Linda University Church Service on this beautiful, wonderful Sabbath morning. Now you say, Pastor, did you come through the rain as we did? Yes, I still say beautiful because inside here, we have this beautiful sanctuary. It's not raining inside of here and the joy of the Lord is in each of us today. Someone say amen. We also wanna give a special welcome to our visitors, our friends, our family members who may be watching online, the internet, or whatever modality you're watching, we welcome you to this service as well. We have an announcement to make, a few announcements. Number one, the Friendship Cup, due to the inclement weather, has been postponed today, and we'll let you know in the future when that will happen again. Also, the special question today, the grace question is, who would be the most surprised to be a recipient of your grace? Who would be the most surprised to be the recipient of your grace? Be sure to text as soon as you can your answers to area 909-255-1280. 909-255-1280. May God bless us as we worship him today in spirit and in truth. Good morning and happy Sabbath church family. Please sing with us and stand as we sing How Great Thou Art. See the 
There's nothing more beautiful than Jesus and what he's done for us. You know, as we gather as a community this morning, we've come maybe not knowing the people next to us, but there is one thing that we do know, and that's the soon and coming Savior. So this morning, would you bow your heads as we pray to him? Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, some of us, with eager hearts for problems, trials, and burdens to be lifted. Father, in the silence of this place, Lord, you know the individual heart of each one of those. God, would you meet us there? Lord, as a nation, God, we cry out for mercy for those who need mercy. We cry out for justice for those who need justice. Father, we cry out also for help. Jesus, this morning... My prayer is that our hearts will be receptive to the Holy Spirit's word and what you're calling us to hear. Lord, I pray and petition you this morning also. God, on behalf of our community, that we would be known as a community that gives grace not just to our friends, not the, just those who are across the pew, but even those who may persecute us along the way. Father, may we be known as those full of grace as you've given that to us. In Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Me 
Good morning, boys and girls. Come on up to the front. I need you to join me right up here on the steps because as you can see, I have some things to show you and to talk to you about. So come have a seat, have a seat. Wow, look at what I brought today. This is a whole lot of money. Does anybody want to guess how much money is in here? $100. Oh my goodness, did you say $100? Any other guesses? Any other guesses? You are so smart. That's exactly how much I have in here. Now you may be wondering, why did I bring all this money? Well, next week, you are going to see dollars waving like this. Now, boys and girls, do you see your mom and dad out there? Or do you see any of our church members? Because I think they're watching us today. Do you see them? I want you to wave at them. So let's see if they wave back at us. Oh, I don't see a lot of waves over here. Oh, look at all the waves. They're waving at you. Now, you know what they just did? They said they would participate next week by bringing a dollar. Thank you so very much. So they're going to be waving dollars for you, and you're going to collect them and bring them right up here to the front, and there are going to be buckets up here. Now you may be thinking, hmm, that's a lot of money. What are we doing that for? What's the money going to go towards? Well, at this time, we have decided that the money is going to a very important ministry called You Reach Ministry. Now, I know you boys and girls have heard that before because we do things through You Reach for our VBS program. Some of the things that we could do through You Reach, well, we could help boys and girls who don't have a home and who are homeless. I know we've made stuff through VBS for the homeless. We could also help boys and girls, maybe, who want to learn more and study and be, get an education, and they can do that through our tutoring program, Excel. And I know we've made bookmarks and stuff for Excel. Or, hmm, we could also help our senior citizens who don't have food or who aren't able to make food and provide money through our Wheels on Meals. And I know we've made soup bags before for the Meals on Wheels. So you know all these ministries. But why do we do something like that? Well, I like to think it's because we want to give back to our community. And you know, I think that a visual may help a little bit because I like to be able to process things and see it. I have a plain piece of paper, eight and, a, eight and a half and 11 piece of paper. And let's pretend that each corner of the piece of paper is a blessing that you have received. Oh, when I close my eyes, I can think of a lot more blessings than just four. But we'll just pretend today that we have four blessings, okay? Count them. One, two, three, four. Four blessings. My heart is so full and overflowing that you know what? I am going to share my blessing with you. Here you go. Here's a blessing for you. Oh, you know, boys and girls, hold your blessing up. 
I just gave her really three blessings, didn't I? Let's count the corners. One, two, three. I give you three blessings. And let's see, how many do I have? One, two, three, four, five. How is it that I have more blessings than when I started and I gave her three? Well, if that's the case, I am going to go ahead and I'm going to give more blessings because I feel that God has done so many things in my life that I am so excited. I'm going to give you a blessing and I'm going to give you a blessing and you can have a blessing. And now all of you have three blessings. It doesn't really matter how many blessings I have, but let's see how many I have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How exciting is that? I thought I gave all my blessings away. But you know, boys and girls, when we, do, when we give what God has given to us to others, all of a sudden, all the blessings pour back into us, double the amount of the blessings that we give to others. And that's what we're going to do, start doing next week and every week after that. We're going to collect money so that we can give blessings to others in the community. Thank you, boys and girls, for listening. You can go back to your seats. And thank you, church family, for willingly participating in this wonderful adventure that we're going to try. <laughs>
give to our building program, you might think to yourself, well, I don't know if I'm giving a loan. Is there anyone else giving to the building program other than me? And sometimes it's a lonely check that we write, or we go online and we have a reoccurring giving. But friends, I want to remind you, you are in good company. You are part of the family that is ever faithful. Do you know that in the month of January, following our giving season, $70,000 came in? Can I get an amen? January has been a good month, even though it is typically the very lowest throughout the year. So thank you. You're on God's team as we build for his kingdom. Friends, I want to take a moment to give you a little update on our brother, and our colleague, Dr. Kimo Smith. He's been in the hospital for the last several days. Many are concerned about him, and I got to visit him yesterday. He looked good. He's in for a case of cellulitis on his leg, and that is what has been so painful, and they've been watching that. He wanted to make sure that his friends and family knew it was not what he had been dealing with before, which was very serious. So we can be thankful for that. Can we pause for a moment of prayer on his behalf? Father, we love our own chemo, and we thank you for giving him to us. Please be near him. Please help him to restore to his uh, health. We ask that you will be close, and may he sense your presence and know that we love him. Bring him, return him to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. The scripture reading for this morning is found in Luke chapter 23, verses 32 to 34, as well as Acts chapter 7, verses 59 and 60. I would invite you to search in your pew Bibles for pages 1573 and 1632. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, and they divide up his clothes by casting lots. And in Acts 7, 59 and 60, it says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. May God bless the reading of his word and may impact us positively today and henceforth. When I think of grace, I remember when I was seven years old. My parents accepted a call as missionaries to Beirut, Lebanon. And when we moved there, we experienced many situations of war. In this one particular situation, we were in the bomb shelter for 10 days. During that 10 days, every day a ceasefire was given where it would give people an opportunity to run home and grab more food and water and clothes and anything else that they needed. On one Friday afternoon, there was a ceasefire. And so my parents gathered, my sisters and I, and we were gonna run to our house about 100 yards away up a hill. We ran home and we were able to quickly gather as many things as we could. And as we stood by the back door, we prayed. And at that moment, we heard some bullets whiz overhead and we dropped to our stomachs and we tried to find the safest place in our house. And we realized that a sniper on an adjacent hill was holding us hostage in our own home. Well, at that moment, we just, we tried to bring comfort to ourselves. So we sang hymns and we held hands and we prayed and we tried to wait it out. But as dusk approached, we realized that we were gonna be in more danger if we stayed in our house and we didn't get back to the bomb shelter by the end of the ceasefire. So we went by the back door and prayed and hugged each other one last time and my parents instructed my sisters and I to just run, run without looking back as fast as we could. So being the youngest, I had to go first and I ran as fast as my little seven-year-old legs could carry me. I could hear the bullets whizzing over my head and I could hear my sisters not far behind. As I got to the bomb shelter, I watched as my sisters came and my parents came. And I realized, even at seven years old, I experienced the most ultimate gift of grace. The sniper could have done more than just scare us. He could have seriously hurt us or killed us. And I was reminded again, what a wonderful gift of grace we are given every day. Quite some years ago now, there was an advice columnist in this country by the name of Ann Landers. Many of you remember reading Ann Landers' advice column. It happened that on one occasion, she wrote a piece about the threat of nuclear war. She talked about what the day after a nuclear war attack would look like. After she underlined the sober reality, she then urged her readers to clip out the column and to mail it to the President of the United States. And so they did. Quite a number of them did, enough so that a couple of weeks later, Ann Landers received a letter from the President himself. Recognizing the fact that he had gotten a couple of hundred of her clippings from the paper and that people had written with concern, certainly with the desire and the interest to create possibilities for peace in the years ahead. And then he said this, However, I think that you have sent this to the wrong place. It should have been sent 
to the Kremlin. Bruce Thielman, Presbyterian minister, reflecting on that exchange, said, Whatever might be your political leanings or persuasions, of this be assured, so often the responsibility rests with the other guys, with the other people. It's their fault. Let them fix it. The 20th century was known for its enemies, for its warfare, for people killing even their own citizens. Jonathan Glover, as he writes a moral history of the 20th century, says that between the years 1900 and 1989, approximately 86 million people died in warfare. That equals about 2,500 people a day, about 100 people an hour for 90 years straight. He goes on to add that in that same period of time, about 120 million people died at the hands of their own governments, most of them being, about 80 million being, between the communist countries of China and the USSR. In fact, so grim was the situation that some of us seated here can remember, can remember fears of nuclear annihilation, fears of nuclear war to come. Many remember living under that kind of deep concern. But the truth is, we sit in a sanctuary that's dry and warm. We sit here probably not concerned about things that are far beyond our ability to control. When it comes to that question of who's against us and what kind of tensions might exist, who might be our enemies, we have other people on our minds. The neighbor whose dog won't stop barking and who won't do anything about it. The friend to whom we loaned money and not only doesn't pay it back, but now avoids us at all costs. The ex-spouse who plays manipulative mind games with the children who refuses to pay child support. The classmate who's spreading vicious and untrue rumors about another classmate. Those are the kinds of realities that we tend to think about, which may call into mind the question, what exactly do we mean when we say the word enemy? I want to read you a couple of dictionary definitions of that term, enemy. If you look it up, on the, at least on the online dictionary, you'll find that there are a number of entries trying to define and describe that word. The first one says this, an enemy is a person who feels hatred for fosters harmful designs against, or engages in antagonistic activities toward another, an adversary or an opponent. And then there are about four different entries dealing with military kinds of en enemies. And then one more option the dictionary provides is this. Enemies are persons, nations, etc., that are hostile to one another. That kind of opens the door makes it a bit more broad as to who might actually qualify as an enemy. It actually makes sense then what G.K. Chesterton said. G.K. Chesterton once said, the Bible tells us to love our enemies. The Bible tells us to love our neighbors. The reason it does, said Chesterton, is that they're usually the same people. <laughs> so enemies, what are we to do with them? Here we come to a last in a series of sermons on grace. You remember the challenge we took up the first week. The challenge was to take seriously what the writer of the letter to the Hebrews had to say about grace. The writer to the letter to the Hebrews said, See to it that no one misses the grace of God. Now that's fairly easily in many instances. Somebody comes to you who is heavy laden with guilt. I don't know what to do about my guilt. And you say to them, there's grace. You encounter a friend who is covered in shame. I feel such deep shame. There's grace. You find someone who's wanting to grow mature in the Christian life. And you say, there's grace. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. But then you picture that enemy, that other, with designs against you, designs to harm you. And you wonder, 
Did the writer of that letter to the Hebrews have in mind that person? When the writer said, see to it that no one misses the grace of God, does that include our enemies? I want to take you to two scenes. One is the scene of a crucifixion. The second is the scene of a stoning. There are quite a number of things that are similar about the scenes. One similarity is that in each case, a person of sterling character is being executed. In each case, that person has gotten on the wrong side of the law, either the civil or the religious law, by preaching the abundant, the abounding grace of God and a system that is rigid and understands God as angry and vindictive cannot take that kind of preaching. And yet they just wouldn't let up. They just continued to promulgate that message to the point where those in charge said they have to be stopped. We cannot allow this to continue. That was true in both cases. In both cases, the experience through which they were about to pass, that which would end their lives, was gruesome and barbaric in the extreme. We have concerns today about not meeting out cruel and unusual punishment. There were no such concerns in those days. In fact, the more cruel, the more unusual the punishment, the better, because that would then become a deterrent to others. There were many similarities between the two. There was at least one key difference. In one case, the one to be executed claimed to be the Son of God. In the other case, the one to be executed was a follower, a disciple of the Son of God. There's one more similarity. One more that we have to notice. But we have to look in on the scenes to catch it. Scene number one. He has staggered down the Via Dolorosa on his way to Calvary. The seething, surging, surging mob screams for his blood. The people who just days before proclaimed him Messiah... Now scream for vindication of this one who is disappointing their hopes. And they arrive at the place. They arrive at that place simply called the skull. They arrive there, and when Luke describes it, his words are spare. His statements are simple. He simply tells us the bare bones outline of what occurred. So we join them, those who were part of that day's experience. We join them in Luke chapter 23, starting with verse 32, where Luke says this, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Father, forgive them. They don't understand their actions. That's the first scene. The second scene takes place in a religious context, just a bit of time after this first scene, just a bit of distance removed. There are some different actors in the second scene than were there in the first scene, but make no mistake about it, there were many who had been in the first scene who were also at the second scene. It was that same harsh, rigid religion, that same negative understanding of God. The man's name was Stephen. He had been identified as one of seven to be the first deacons of the Christian church. He was a good man, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. He went about performing acts of mercy, acts of charity that transformed people's lives. But he also spoke, he also preached 
And it was probably that more than anything else that got him into deep trouble. They first tried to stop Stephen with their words. They first tried to overcome him with their statements and their arguments and their accusations. But it didn't work. They just couldn't contravene the power that attended everything he said. And so that day came when he too stood before a kangaroo court, a court that was ready to sentence him as he proclaimed this Jesus. In fact, as it reached its crescendo with his proclamation of Jesus, they, they covered their ears and screaming like wild hoodlums, they rushed upon him and raced him outside of the city. Picking up stones as they ran, they knew exactly what they had to do. And it's right there that we join the scene. This time in Acts, same author, Luke having written both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7, starting with verse 59. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. I suppose another way you might make that same statement would be to say, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. Two men of sterling character. Our Lord Jesus Christ and Stephen, the first Christian martyr. If you were to take this book and thumb through its pages looking for the best example of how to treat one's enemies, the best example of grace to enemies, I would challenge you to find better examples than those two. After all, it is quite likely that Stephen, either having experienced or having heard about what happened in the first scene, realized that he too had to walk in the same footsteps in the second. What's curious is that in neither passage do we find the word grace it's not there but the aroma of grace overcomes the foul odor of death that lingers in the air here is an example of how to extend grace to our enemies So what might that look like? What might that look like in real life? In those situations we talked about earlier, the roommate, the, the ex-spouse, the neighbor, what might, what might it look like? What might it look like when we encounter, when we engage the culture around us, which many times has become increasingly hostile toward people of faith? What might it look like? Philip Yancey, in his excellent book, Vanishing Grace, tells two stories. Two stories that paint a word picture, helping us understand what it might look like in today's context to extend grace to those who are hostile. The first is actually a story from Donald Miller, author, that Yancey quotes. Yancey tells about Donald Miller and a group of other Christ followers making a decision at a university in Oregon to do something during a period of time when there was a festival, a celebration there on the university campus that usually was characterized by drunkenness and debauchery, by hostility toward anything religious. Miller and his friends decided, we're going we're to set up a booth there to interact with, to engage with the students who are there on the campus and who are involved in this festival. But we're going to do something a bit different. We're not there to preach to them, to convince them of the correctness of our view, to try to pull them across an evangelistic line. We're going to listen to them And when they have been wounded 
by religious people, we will apologize. I want to read to you, read to you what Yancey writes of that story. Yancey says, as Miller confessed to one startled curiosity seeker, this is what he said in his confession, Jesus said to feed the poor and to heal the sick. I've never done very much about that. Jesus said to love those who persecute me. I tend to lash out, especially if I feel threatened. You know, if my ego gets threatened. Jesus did not mix his spirituality with politics. I grew up doing that. It got in the way of the central message of Christ. I know that was wrong, and I know that a lot of people will not listen to the words of Christ because of people like me who know him. We're carrying out our own agendas into conversations rather than just relaying the message Christ wanted to get across. The curiosity seeker was startled. Over the next several hours, Miller and his friends spoke to scores of fellow students. Many people wanted to hug when we were done, he writes. All of the people who visited the booth were grateful and gracious. I was being changed through the process. I went in with doubts and came out believing. The second story Yancey tells. It's the story of a man named Craig Detweiler. Craig Detweiler taught communications and acting and directing and such things. He had students from both Pepperdine University and Biola University that that accompanied him to the Sundance Film Festival. It's a great festival for independent movies that are made, maybe the best one of such kinds of festivals around. So he would take his students there, and they would get an opportunity to see the, the films and the movies and to interact with those who had made them and to learn as part of their class experience. As they were there one year, Detweiler says there was a film that many people wanted to see that was a film that basically mocked Christian faith. They took some of the realities of ways that maybe Christians have behaved over time, maybe some of the unkind and rough edges that have been manifested and shown, and they, and they exaggerated them in the film. And so Detweiler said that he and his friends went to the film. He said it was a blistering portrayal of evangelicals. Making us, he said, look as bad as one could conceive. There was uproarious laughter, applause throughout the film. Finally, it ended to a standing ovation. There was a question and answer period afterwards with the director. One of the first questions was, have you talked to or heard from any evangelical Christians yet? And the director said, not yet, but don't worry, I'm preparing for that fight. And again, there was great applause. I want at that point in the story to read from Yancey. Yancey writes, Without thinking, Craig Detweiler stood to his feet with a response. I'll let him relate what happened next. These now are Detweiler's words. I struggled to compose my words. My voice cracked slightly. I eked out. Jay, the director, Jay, thank you for this film. As of a native of North Carolina, a fellow filmmaker and an evangelical Christian, I never use the word evangelical. It is so loaded with negative baggage that I usually attempt to distance myself from such associations. But in this instance, it seemed right. I was speaking for my community. Responding to a particular stance we had staked out for ourselves, Jay stepped back, ready for that fight. He tensed up, preparing to launch a counterattack. The crowd sensed that things were about to get ugly. My next words caught them off guard. Jay, I apologize to you for anything ever done to you in the name of God. The entire tenor in the room shifted. Audience members turned around. Did did I hear that correctly? They craned their necks. Who said that? Jay fumbled for words, not knowing how to respond. He was ready to be attacked. He was not prepared for an apology. 
He offered a modest thank you. The audience was literally disarmed. Audience members approached me afterward with hugs. A lesbian couple thanked me. Gay men kissed me. One person said, if that is true, I might consider giving Christianity another chance. Tears were shed far and wide. And all it took were two little words. I apologize. My students leaped at the occasion, talking to the cast and crew, inviting them to join us for further conversation. Our, quote, enemies, unquote, became fast friends, joining us for lunch. The cast came to our class the next day, answering questions for an hour. An actor admitted how scared he was to enter our church meeting place. On stage, he confided, coming into this building, my heart was beating faster than at any audition I've ever had. The producer said, this was the most significant moment of our week. A simple apology set off a series of conversations and exchanges about our faith and how we live it. And then closing with Yancey's words. Experiences such as these convinced me that the approach of admitting our errors, besides being most true to a gospel of grace, is also most effective at expressing who we are. Propaganda turns people off. Humbly admitting mistakes disarms. Far from claiming to have it all together, Christians regularly confess that we do not. After all, Jesus said he came for the sick, not the well, for sinners, not for saints. In the words of the old gospel song, he looks beyond my faults and sees my needs. True followers of Jesus distinguish themselves primarily by admitting guilt when needed and asking for help. Maybe that's what it looks like. When the enemies are picking up stones as they rush you outside of the city. When the soldiers are grabbing the hammer and the nails. When our temptation is to stand up and defend ourselves, to attack back. What if, what if, instead of responding the way we naturally would, we admit it when we're wrong, and we pray, God, forgive them. The truth is, such realities make a difference even in the secular world. Some of you will remember the Hall of Fame third baseman, Wade Boggs, Boston Red Sox. The story is told about Boggs going into Yankee Stadium, hostile territory. Boggs wasn't that worried about the Yankees. They didn't get under his skin as much. But every time they played in Yankee Stadium, there was a fan with a box seat just right up close that used to pepper him with a continual onslaught of all kinds of negative taunts and statements and names. Boggs, you stink! Bogs, you well, you fill in the blanks. It started while they were warming up, and he, he, he honestly, you wouldn't think it would happen, but honestly, it got under his skin. It got to just bothering him so much, he was having a hard time concentrating on the Yankees because of this one fan constantly after him. And then finally, one day, he had had it. It started again. They were just warming up, started again. Bogs, you stink. This time he stopped what he was doing and he walked over by the box seats and he looked up. He said, are you the guy that's always yelling at me? And he said, yeah, what are you going to do about it? And Boggs reached into his pocket, took out a new baseball and autographed it. And then he tossed it up to the man and turned and walked back to third base. Do you know that not only did that fan never yell at him again, he came, became one of Boggs' greatest Yankee Stadium fans. It happens even in the secular world. So what about those of us 
who claim the name of Christ. Those of us who have decided that we too, along with Stephen, will put our feet into those blood-stained footsteps of the man of Calvary. What if we responded that way? To the person who hasn't paid us, the person whose dog barks all the time, the person who cuts us off in the free... You know who I'm talking about. What if we respond that way? After all, I suspect that while he may not specifically have thought of Stephen or Jesus, we don't know, I suspect that when the writer to the Hebrews wrote those words, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. I suspect he had in mind my neighbor and your ex-spouse and that fellow classmate too. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. Stephen saw to it He saw to it for those, every one of those who picked up stones to hurl. And Jesus prayed for every single one who put him on that cross. For those religious leaders that raced him out of town, down the Via Dolorosa, those Roman soldiers who pounded the nails. And for you and for me. We put him there too. And he prayed for us. He saw to it that we not miss the grace of God. And now, now it's our turn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see.
We praise you from the bottom of our hearts and souls for your grace. Your grace made most clear and evident on Calvary. Your grace made most clear and evident toward your enemies. Lord, thank you for that example. So fill us with the Spirit of God that we might have the courage and the strength to follow. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.